This is Whitley Strieber, and this is Dreamland. You've reached the edge of the world. Today we are talking to two very, very seasoned investigators, Tom Carey and Don Schmidt, best-selling authors of Witness to Roswell, their new book, UFO Secrets Inside Wright Patterson, eyewitness accounts from the real Area 51, with a forward by the departed and beloved Stanton Friedman, authors of Flying Saucers and Science. This is a an extraordinary journey I have taken in this book and will take to Gay with you guys. Both of you, welcome to Dreamland. Nice to be Pleasure with to you, be Whitley. With you. Yeah, well, good. You. Well, let me tell us, tell our folks a little bit about you. Tom Carey is a former Air Force officer where he possessed a top secret crypto clearance. Uh, his research has focused slowly on the so-called Roswell incident, the alleged retrieval cover-up by the U.S. government, et cetera, and so forth, near Roswell in July of 47. Don Schmidt is the former co-director of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies. He served as director of special investigations for 10 years. Uh, Don is the author of dozens of articles about UFOs. In fact, if you are interested in this subject, the name Don Schmidt has got to be in your mind, and Tom Carey, too. Uh, and he's also, of course, co-author with, Tom, with uh, Tom of Witness to Roswell and the Children of Roswell. Well, okay, we have uh, here a new journey, and it's not about Roswell. Uh, if we, I'll just ask you, to sort of speak in turn, because I, you guys are both, I know, equally uh, cognizant about the book. And sometimes it's, you know, one author wrote one part and another author wrote another part. But uh, let me ask you this. What directed you first? And Don, you can answer this to area F- uh, to uh, right, Pat. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, uh, the, well, the first direction was that the, the witness testimony uh, from the the actual participants, Whitley, uh, the ones who knew not not everybody knew where the wreckage and the bodies were going, but the ones who did know uh, all said they were going to at the time Wright Field, which uh, ultimately became Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So uh, the the witness testimony uh, was primary, but then when we uh, started looking at the history of Wright-Patterson, and especially during World War II, where all of the uh, back engineering of the uh, Axis uh, uh, aircraft, uh, the Messerschmitts uh, that uh, Don used to fly, and uh, some of the Mitsubishis uh, all went to uh, Wright, Wright-Patterson, Wright Field. You know, Don, I have to admit, I did not know. You said that, Don, you flew Messerschmitts? No, at- no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little. I'm sorry, Whitley. That's Inside a little <laughs> joke because of my last name. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, okay, <laughs> because I'm interested in enough. planes, and I would have loved to have he- heard from somebody who flew <laughs> flew those after the war. I mean, it never occurred to me. Of course, you wouldn't be in the though, war, but uh, though I I do belong to the EAA, and uh, I love. I, in fact, I flew for a good number of years. I, I co-owned a Cessna 310 a twin engine for quite a few years, and I, I miss it terribly. I, uh, I'll bet you do. private piling, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a wonderful way to live if you've got your own plane and can f- fly privately. The whole world opens up in a to- totally new way. A uh, little, little inside joke, uh, Whitley. Yes, <laughs> yes. But, but just to add to what, uh, what, what Tom had mentioned, even going back to the original press accounts back at the time, and um, after... The uh, that banner headline, that press release that went out on July eighth, uh, Tuesday of 1947, that they'd actually captured a flying saucer. Then the follow up press accounts were, well, where is the wreckage going? Where is all of this going? And from all accounts, that it was going to right field. I mean, that was uh, you know no secret at that time. And then that same day when they had that infamous press conference at Fort Worth for General Roger Ramey, uh, the head of the 8th Air Force, uh, the commander over Colonel William Blanchard, who was the base commander at, Wright, at uh, Roswell Army Airfield, 
He announces he's canceling the flight. I've explained it all the way. It's nothing more than a weather balloon. And yet, the wreckage, the real stuff, still goes on the right field. Even the FBI telex that went out that evening from the Dallas Bureau office confirmed that, that the material was still going for testing and analysis, as Tom just described. So there is a part two, and that's what the whole right field, the right Patterson story is all about that you have people on the recovery end, those who retrieved the wreckage, the remains, and then after it was sent out from Roswell, where did it go? Well, there was no Area 51 back at that time, but it went to Wright-Patterson. And we have all the witnesses, as we describe and we lay out in this book, who on the receiving end, who then take it for analysis and testing, and then all the talk about the secret hangars, the underground vaults, the underground levels, and up until even the early 80s, such accounts, which uh, are, are uh, fully described throughout the book. And yeah, let's talk just briefly about, well, well let's, you know, let's start with Barry Goldwater and Curtis LeMay. Uh, tell us what happened. Barry Goldwater knew Curtis LeMay, and he knew that Curtis LeMay knew all about this. So he asked Curtis LeMay, tell us what happened. Yes, uh... Uh, Barry Goldwater, uh, most people remember him as a uh, first as a U U.S. senator from Arizona and the Republican candidate uh, in 1964 for the presidency. And uh, to a great extent, the uh, even though he lost in a landslide to uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, he changed the Republican Party at, uh, and uh, put it on a more conservative bent. Now, uh, Goldwater, in addition to being a United States senator and a chairman at some point uh, to the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, he was also a major general in the Air Force Reserve. So he's uh, wearing two hats, and uh, he became friends with uh, the, the former commander of the uh, Roswell base back in '47, and a William Butch Blanchard. They became friends because they were both generals, and uh, that's how Goldwater learned about Roswell. He he had been a what we would call a UFO buff, somebody who's interested in UFOs. You know, dabbles, follows some of the maybe read uh, some of the books and that sort of stuff, uh, which at that time would have probably been by Donald Kehoe. But uh, in his relationship with Blanchard, uh, he learned about the Roswell crash and uh where the wreckage went and as don said it uh we learned that it all went to uh right field right patterson so uh he knows blanchard he's heard about roswell and uh, he's also very good he admits to being good friends with uh, uh lieutenant general uh, curtis lemay who at that time uh from 1961 to 1965, LeMay was the Air Force Chief of Staff, the highest-ranking Air Force uh, officer. So, uh, Goldwater, and we figure it's uh, the, that the, the Blue Room episode occurred in 1963. That's the nearest we can pinpoint it, because Goldwater... And, and let's, let's, let's hold on a minute. Uh, we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to find out what the Blue Room episode was. We'll be right back. This is the first time in nearly two years that I have been able to say you can subscribe to unknowncountry.com. The site has two levels of offering, a free offering and a subscriber offering. The, in the free offering, you are able to listen to the first two segments of Dreamland. You're able to listen to the first half of the experience and the first part also of The Unseen. You are also able to access our free message board. All you have to do is register for the message board. It's absolutely free in order to use it. However, there is so much more here. There is a treasure trove in our archive, a whole education in a new way of living and being. It is that big. Dating from 2004, it covers Dreamland, all of our other shows, Ann Strieber's wonderful, mysterious powers, 
William Henry's revelations in its entirety. Every experience that we have ever had, I mean, Jeremy Vaney's experience, and all kinds of meditations. You get free audiobooks of Communion, Majestic, The Secret School. You get a community. You can join our subscriber chats every Wednesday evening at 7. There is so much to do here. If you are on a journey looking for what it means to have contact, what it may mean in the future, and what the truth is about what we know now, not only about what the government knows, but what do we experiencers know about what it's like. This is where you come. It is really the only place in the world like it. So join us today. Go to unknowncountry.com. Click on the Subscribe Now tab on the masthead. Use your credit card or PayPal, whichever you prefer, and join this marvelous, special community today. We're talking to Tom Carey and Don Schmidt, their new book, UFO Secrets, Inside Wright Patterson, Eyewitness Accounts from the Real, Area 51. And we were just before we left the air, we were talking about the Blue Room incident. What what exactly was that? Well. Uh, as I said, uh, Goldwater, uh, in his role as the uh, chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, found himself one day uh, at the right to Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and uh, so he says, hmm, I've heard about this blue room where all the alien artifacts are uh, supposed to be stored. So he says, well, I'm here. Uh, I'm going to have a look at that. So he calls up his friend, and I emphasize his good friend, uh, General Curtis LeMay, who's in Washington, Air Force Chief of Staff. He says, uh, General, uh, I hear that there's a room uh, here at Wright-Patterson that has all of that uh, uh, extraterrestrial stuff in it. Uh, might I have a look inside? And uh, as Goldwater describes it, he says, uh, 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 what's this? Uh, uh, Curtis LeMay flew off the handle. He says, don't you ever ask me that again. Of course you can't go in there. I can't go in there. I, I, hereby, you know, I forbid you from going in there, and don't ever ask me that question again. I'll, I'll see that you're court-martialed. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, they, <laughs> these guys are friends, you know? Yeah. Imagine if they weren't friends. Now, and, d- d- Curtis LeMay did say that he himself couldn't go in there, didn't yes. he? Yes. That's in a very important statement. Do you guys have any idea why he would say that? Either one of you answer. Well, it's not as though he wouldn't have had the highest of clearances in that capacity. Right. Uh, and even prior to that, he was uh, the deputy director of, of research and development at the Pentagon, so they would have been you know, up to their eyeballs as far as with the Roswell debris analysis. Uh, I, I think it was just emphasizing the level of security, the level of clearance required. Uh, the, the, th- the thought that LeMay himself would not have had access would really be stretching the truth. The, uh, uh, he, it's he, either one of two things. It's either what Don just said, that uh, it was a uh, point of emphasis in uh, talking with Goldwater, or else that the whole situation uh, had a higher security than even the uh, Air Force Chief of Staff had. It's one which, of those which I think is possible, I, because I think that there's levels of this. I mean, I've been dealing with this for a long time, too, just like you guys have. Not as so much as a researcher, but as an experiencer who my life uh, moves into the research area from time to time. But there's something else going on. In other words, I wouldn't be surprised if LeMay really couldn't enter that space, at least not safely. Well, and then if we consider, too, as far as the standard compartmentalization as far as the military, but then as we both, we all know the situation as far as the appointment of the Oversight Committee, whether one believes it was Majestic 12 or as even General Exxon, and we thank you, Whitley, for, for leading us to Exxon. No, thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. At the beginning of the investigation and his description at the Pentagon that it was called the Unholy 13. 
that as they take charge and even uh, supersede the office of the president, so to speak, because it continues from administration to administration, that they would even bar the highest elements of the military from involvement, from oversight, that they were in charge. And it grows into this monolithic as far as entity that uh, I think that's what, what we're observing now with the military in that they feel that they're on the outside looking in, that they don't even have access to the very data, the, the history of the phenomena as it's accumulated since 1947. And so LeMay may have been, you know, describing precisely the situation that, hey, I mean, I don't even have a key to the room, so don't ask. Yeah, I th- I think he probably was because well you know now what year was that if I may ask that the Goldwater Lemay exchange took place? Well, it was as near as we could figure it, accounting based on what Goldwater said. It was 1963. Okay, that would have been after Nixon had taken Jackie Gleason to see the materials in Florida, I believe. Uh, well, yeah. well, because well, uh, the thing changed then. When Nixon took Gleason, and nobody knew how to stop them, after that, presidents were no longer briefed unless they asked, and then they were never given any locations. They weren't told where they could go. Uh, because Well, the interesting connection, and, and, and a lot of people, for whatever reason, you know, political reasons or not, uh, would like to even disqualify Nixon with having a need to know, but but keeping in mind that he was Eisenhower as VP for two terms. Yeah, yeah, he knew before he even entered office, because at the beginning, this secrecy was normal. In other and words, uh, uh, Truman and his vice president, Truman, et cetera, all knew about this. And Eisenhower was chief of staff of the Army in 1947, so he would have had complete access. So there was absolutely no disconnect as far as with Nixon. Also being, you know, party to uh, the uh, the situation at that time. So we have to always, you know, do our, our our due diligence with our history, and then we see how it all plugs in that you can connect the dots. And as Tom was describing, uh, it all comes back to Roswell and Blanchard and Goldwater. We have a, a letter from Goldwater where he describes what close friends he was with Blanchard, and so uh, that's what started that that entire scenario. That uh, he wasn't telling he wasn't telling Goldwater about a balloon fiasco back in forty seven. I can assure you. Well, you know, every single thing they they've come up with, even this latest one, that's in uh, it's floating around that it was really Russian children disguised as aliens, is just. I mean, well, it's, I'm fascinated by the creativity. The Air Force, which was, it's a military organization, creativity is not part of really what they do. But they have done a wonderful job with this. They have been very creative from the all beginning. All the subterfuge, all the smoke screen, the mudding the waters. They were doing it back at the time of the incident. You'd have had that they were recovering uh, flying saucers all around Roswell at that time. Take your pick. But we all, Tom and I always refer to these as the theories of the month. Because, but it, it, the, the one positive thing, Whitley, is that it does demonstrate that they don't accept the last official explanation from the government. That they're still always throwing as far as uh, something new up against the wall to see if it sticks. But the <laughs> yeah. whole nonsense of, uh, you know, the Russian uh, recovered German flying wing and that uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele, Dr. Death, was, you know, experimenting with children and created some mutants to appear alien, and they crashed in the heart of New Mexico back in 1947. Again, you have to look back at history. Joseph Mengele was not captured by the Soviets. He did escape to South America, where he did live out the rest of his life. There was only one recovered German uh, flying wing, and that's presently at the Smithsonian Museum. And um, the very source on that whole story has recanted and uh, claims that he was just trying to help sell books. Yeah, so, uh, and it just do- doesn't work. It, it really is remarkable that this has gone on. And we're going to take another very brief break here for our free Dreamlanders, and then we are going to get uh, into a little bit about 
the whys of the secrecy because the three of us, I knew Don, uh, uh, General Exxon, uh, Don and uh, Tom, I guess, both met him and talked to him. So there's really a a lot to talk about. We'll be right back. Did you know that the Unknown Country newsletter is absolutely free and comes to you by email once a week? The newsletter has been published since 2000, and in all that time, not one subscriber has ever received a single piece of spam because they were on our list. But what they have received, week in and week out, is the very latest from UnknownCountry.com, including a Dreamland preview and all the latest news. Go to UnknownCountry.com and sign up today. You owe it to yourself, and it's free. Listen to some words from one of our longtime subscribers. As a subscriber of Dreamland for many years, it's been an incredible adventure and uh, truly a Rosetta Stone for so many of the experiences that all of all of your listeners have had. Please join us. It's a fantastic ride. But I will say that, that certainly Dreamland does reflect something that I've always, always known, that man's mind mirrors a universe that mirrors man's mind. And no other place will you get this truth than on Dreamland. Come join us. Not too many shows get endorsements like that from people who have been with us for years. Join us. Join the fun. Join the adventure. Join the exploration. Four ninety-five a month, thirty-nine fifty a year, six month and three month subscriptions too. Go to unknowncountry.com. Click on the subscribe tab on the upper right and get aboard. You will not be sorry. It's a great experience to be part of this community. Where do you find Eben Alexander, Dean Radin, Jim Mars, Joseph Farrell, Zechariah Sitchin, William Henry, George Nury, Lawrence Gardner, Trish and Rob McGregor, Marie D. Jones, Marla Fries, Peter Lavenda, Richard Dolan, Starfire Tour, Linda Moulton Howe, and hundreds of others all telling you their deepest secrets in the Dreamland Archive on UnknownCountry.com. All yours for under $5 a month. Go to UnknownCountry.com and subscribe today. Hours of listening pleasure. Expect to be amazed. We're talking to... Don Schmidt and Tom Carey, UFO Secrets Inside Wright Patterson, eyewitness accounts from the real Area 51. And later on, we're going to be getting into the question of what is there now. But right now, uh, let's go back a little bit to, to General Exxon. Let's talk about General Exxon. I, my uncle Mickey, who was also at Wright Pat, in 47, when, where General Exxon was, in fact, they worked together, was uh, introduced me to General Exxon, and uh, he was very forthcoming. He was an older man at that point, and uh, interestingly enough, he told me that he was still consulting with uh, the, the group the, uh, that was working on this, and he said an interesting thing. He said, because so much of what we did was not put on paper at all for fear of exposure. And therefore, he had to, he had to go back to write practically once a month, even and this was, it must have been in 88, uh, to, uh, to consult with them and let them know what had happened during his tenure uh, uh, when he was a uh, uh, com- commanding officer at Wright Pad and before that. What do you make of that? I, I was I never could get it out of him what he was doing, but did you guys get any sense of that? No, uh, Whitley, when we met uh, the general, uh, it was in his retirement community. He and his lovely wife, this is down in, what is it, Irvine? Was it Irvine, no, it was, California? Uh, River, Riverside, California. Riverside. I always get the two mixed up. Uh, when we met uh, the general and his wife, uh, I was surprised at how little he would tell us. This is like in the year, I don't know, 1999, 2000, 2000 somewhere in that uh, range. And, uh, we, you know, we had lunch with him at his retirement village, and I thought, you know, when we arrived, I said, oh, boy, we're going to get it all firsthand from the general now. But he would, he was really 
clammed up by that time, so somebody must have talked to him. No, yeah, I would. I know I can't go into that, but yes, uh, well, th- there was no question about it. It's too bad you didn't get to him a few years earlier. Is well, all I, I had, can say. I had, I had met with him before that, and he was much more open, more frank. When about, did you meet with him? If I may ask. Well, I met with Exxon. I know, but when, when, when? Oh, well, that date? would have been in '93. Uh, yeah. Okay. So early '90s. That's right. Once they knew that he was talking to people outside of the immediate family, and I'm, you know, I'm part of the family, and that that my uncle and my cousins, we were, our family was big and close and involved in this in a lot of different number. I wouldn't say a lot, but a number of different ways. Even when I was a child. So uh, it was in the family, but outside of the family, no. And there's still a lot of stuff that, you know, I wish I could talk about, but I've been asked not to by p- people I respect, my uncle and my, my and General Exxon, and said to never talk about this, that, or the other thing. And it's very frustrating. But we can it, it, talk it about them because if I ask you questions about them, you'll have the answers, I hope. That's, and Tom, if, and I have faced that. You know, more times than not, especially with the the officers before they all passed away uh, from Roswell and and right Pat, uh, and also keeping in mind that uh, when the late Congressman Stephen Schiff was working with us and failing through the Pentagon and the White House, and he had thrown everything over to the General Accounting Office and uh, for looking into the uh, the documents and the way the money changed hands. Uh, through the different branches of the military regarding Ros 147. And the one witness who they met with was General Exxon. They actually went to his home in Riverside. And, and there, too, he had the impression that he had already spoken out of turn, that it was better that he would start, you know, cooperating to a lesser degree. And he made the comment, he said, uh, I, I suppose I should be careful that my place is being bugged from now on. And yeah, it was that that yeah. happened in the in the, uh, he he became certain of that in the late nineties. Yes, yes, and the one agent with the GAO said, "Well, if it hasn't before, I'm sure it will be from this moment on." That they would even make such a concession that uh, he was he was. Touching, he was getting into an area of high sensibility, high sensitivity, and as a result, that uh, his life would never be the same. So uh, I'm glad I had spoken with before that. I'm certainly glad and pleased that you had Whitley. And then when Tom and I followed up with him years later, there was quite a change. Yeah, I, I, I also tried to get my uncle to talk. No dice. Yes, I mean he was thing, he was as clammed up as my dad, who was the most clammed up human being I ever knew. But, what I one of the amazing things that uh, I found about the, the general was that here he was in the mid nineteen sixties, the commander of Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Right, he's the commander. Yeah. Right, but he doesn't he doesn't have access to the to the blue room. That's the, right, and you know I just I. I I wish I could. I don't know why. That's why I asked you guys about that earlier. This is the one thing I couldn't get out of him. I couldn't. I, yeah, what the he hell? Make... I asked him because, frankly, General Exxon actually, uh, well, he knew an awful lot. Right at first, when everything came in, he had direct access to everything, both me- metallic and biological. But then when it was all sequestered away, the access was very limited. To Didn't just, have a need to know, right? Well, no, there was something else about that. There was something about the materials or about, I think it's about the biology that they didn't, they don't want people to get near. And I don't know what that is. And I'm just, I wondered and wondered about that. Well, the, the biology part of it, is, uh, uh, I think Don will agree with me, is the most important part of it. Uh, all of the explanations, the explanations of the month, when they talk about the physical wreckage, you can explain away physical wreckage as, oh, well, that's our top, uh, that's a, one of our latest spy planes or fighter planes. But the little bodies with the big heads, you cannot explain away 
uh, uh, with anything earthly. You cannot explain it away. And the little bodies were always the most important part of the cover-up because the, the people who uh, received the death threats were all, all people who had seen the, uh, the little bodies or knew of them. And do you know of anyone who actually died uh, because of having too loose a lip was killed? A lot of rumors regarding that. Uh, we have heard of um, even a high-ranking officer's young child uh, that was um, mysteriously shot. Uh, it was a drive-by shooting in Roswell. We've tried to confirm that. Uh, disappearances. We, we certainly know of all the threats. Mac Brazel's son, I believe, disappeared. And children. Mac Brazel's son disappeared, right? Uh, yes, but then he resurfaced. We did a whole chapter on that in the Children of Roswell book. Okay, and I haven't interviewed you about that, and I didn't even, act, to be honest with you, until I saw this, I didn't realize it had even been written, and I never saw anything about it. So, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. amazing that uh, uh, that we're talking about Vernon Brazel is that he, he would uh, disappear, he went away. And he never contacted his parents or family again. That is amazing that uh, you wouldn't you you wouldn't contact your own family to say uh, that he was alive. You know, he just disappeared, took another name, and committed suicide. Because I heard he was a talker. I, I didn't. I, that's... that's what we believe, and we've heard that as well. And that when he was in the Navy, which he had just uh, finished his, his tour returned back to New Mexico, and then how quickly he disappeared thereafter, as though he had spoken out of turn to a number of people. And Tom and I have heard from a number of sources stories uh, of what the Brazo family has confided and has even shown to them through the years. And so it appears that uh, the loose lips uh, situation again, that if they don't eliminate you, they remove you from the picture, so to speak. Right, and it was something like that goes on, and I know that in my own family, the the reason I think that my uncle was so closed mouthed, and my dad, I know my dad was somehow involved, but for a very strange reason, that we lived on a street, Elizabeth Road in San Antonio, and the next street over, there were a number of, I believe, paperclip scientists. But also, uh, Guy Hicks, who was yes. the at, at, who who was the commanding officer when the Mantell incident took place. That is correct. And there was an FBI agent who lived across the street from us, and a couple of houses down. And I th am pretty sure that Dad would go over to Tuttle Road all the time at night, and Mother did not like us kids even going on it. She didn't even want us to ride our bikes on it. We would play with the Hicks kids, and we were always very gently asked what we talked about. And, of course, I was an innocent little boy. I, I We never talked about much of anything. And However, when we did talk about that, and it did happen once or twice, as I vaguely recall, I don't think I mentioned it to my dad. I, I think it, it sort of stopped in my throat. But anyway, let's... But you make an excellent point, Whitley, and that, uh, you know, that our book, Children of Roswell, the idea that they especially watched the children. Yes, yes. To then learn if the parents, if the fathers were, you know, obeying orders, were keeping their mouths shut. And what better sources of such, you know, information than the very children? Right, exactly. Okay, we're going to take another break, folks, and then we're going to go even deeper. We're going to talk about somebody called June Crane, and you're not going to forget that name after you figure out and find out why. We'll be right back. Did you know that the Unknown Country newsletter is absolutely free and comes to you by email once a week? The newsletter has been published since 2000, and in all that time, not one subscriber has ever received a single piece of spam because they were on our list. But what they have received, week in and week out, is the very latest from UnknownCountry.com, including a Dreamland preview and all the latest news. Go to UnknownCountry.com and sign up today. You owe it to yourself, and it's free. 
Subscribers, did you know that there is an organization out there for experiencers that offers a lot of free services? It's called experiencer.org. It's the free organization originally founded by Dr. Edgar Mitchell, and it's there for you, experiencer.org. We're talking to Tom Carey and Don Schmidt, UFO secrets inside Wright Patterson, eyewitness accounts from the real Area 51. Now, I want to kind of jump ahead in the story because June Crane is so important and actually sets the scene for so much of what we will be talking about over the next hour. Uh, now, the tell us first of all, who she was. June Crane was a uh, former clerk typist, a stenographer, who worked for 10 years at Wright uh, Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, and she, she worked in the, one of the locations there where a lot of the scientists who were involved in the recovery uh, and the analysis uh, where they worked. So he, she overheard a lot. And uh, she was actually discovered by another UFO uh, investigator named James Clarkson, who lives in uh, Washington State. Jim was giving a talk one evening, and, you know, after your talk, uh, you take questions, and even after that, they come up and they speak to you, uh, you know, confidentially. And June Crane was one of those. I believe her maiden name was Kaba, June Kaba Crane. And this is like in the nineteen uh, early nineties. I think Don and Kevin Randall met with her or talked with her uh, around nineteen ninety two. In that time frame, we had but talked to her first, and at the time, she would not allow us to use her name. Right. We used an, another name, which we recounted in our first book. You have a uh, I, forget the, I forget what the name was that you used. Sarah. Yeah. Sarah Holcomb, yeah. right? That's right. Yeah, right. Sarah Holcomb is Sarah the name Holcomb. you used. And uh, she, had, she had the story. She didn't want it used. But by 1995, 96, she's dying of cancer. She says, uh, I'm 70 years old. What are they going to do to me uh, uh, I'm near the end anyway, so she tells James Clarkson the story, but uh, she gave him permission to use her name, and uh, he wrote it uh, in a book called uh, Tell My Story. So the yeah. story is the story is that uh, uh, there's several parts to it, that uh, oh, an officer had come by, from uh, New Mexico, and she's she's in there doing you know her job, and he throws a piece of metal on the table. He says, "What do you think that? Uh, where do you think that came from?" And she says, "Wow, let me have a look at that." And it's a piece of what we call memory metal, our Holy Grail of Roswell, that you can uh, wind up in your hand, and then you put it down and it unfurls itself. It's indestructible. And uh, she says, "I I can't figure this out. Where did you get this?" And uh, I don't recall if he told her or uh, someone came in the room and he had to quick put it back in his pocket. But the ultimately, yes. she found out that it was it came from Roswell. And uh, there was another story where a sergeant came in and uh, he started telling her about uh, he, he was just back from Roswell, New Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, and it went about a crash saucer. So uh, she's heard these stories and... Uh, one of the other things she did, and I'm being brief here, uh, was uh, she was taking a, uh, she was doing a stenographic work for Jeff Werner von Braun, and uh, she's you know he's dictating and she's typing away, and somehow the subject got on to Roswell, and uh, she says, uh, "Doctor, uh, you know uh, what about that?" And he says, "Well, and this is now 1952." This is her last year that she worked there. This is 1952. She, Werner von Braun tells her, "Well, there, we have we've had three crashes, and uh, but the only one she could remember was Roswell. She couldn't remember the other two. But uh, we we also know that uh, von Braun was heavily involved in in the Roswell case. Uh, we can talk about that uh, in 
in another segment, but uh, uh, June Crane was was uh, right there on the scene at Wright Patterson, taking notes, listening to the uh, listening to the scientists, and she said, just listening to that, they were just talking about Roswell in a matter of fact way, not like the oh gee whiz that sort of thing. It was just like something that uh, that was in their sphere of uh, uh, employment and. Uh, very, very credible. We would, we would consider it a deathbed type uh, testimony, in that she was allowed, she allowed us to use her name. And so she, she basically, she saw the memory medal. Is there anything else there from her? Uh, boy, you know, my my mind is a. Uh, um, she, she actually handled the memory medal. Uh, she hold it, heard the stories, and uh, there was another gentleman that came by a sergeant that uh i think he said something like i i just saw the bodies i think it was he said i just saw the bodies and uh that was all he could he says that's all i could tell you and uh that that's pretty much it but of course seeing the bodies is maybe in many ways the most important part of this because the metal and debris have been studied, and some some of that has even bled out into uh, sort of semi-public areas at this point. But the bodies, tell us about the bodies. Well, the uh, the bodies, of course, we first heard from the, the eyewitnesses, and the, they were all described as three and a half to four feet tall, very frail, maybe 30, 40 pounds, something like that. Extra long arms that maybe went down to the what we would call kneecaps, uh, but the overriding salient feature w- w- was the large, oversized head, shaped like a, an inverted uh, pear, something like that, and uh, wide set eyes that sort of uh, uh, trailed off into the temples. You know, sort of uh, not 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 as something not like the. Uh, the eyes that you see on some of the depictions of abductions, not not quite that large, uh, but uh, trending in that direction. Uh, no nose, just two little holes in the front of the face for where the nostrils, uh, where the nose would be, and a small slit for a mouth, uh, maybe an inch or an inch and a half uh, wide, and no ears, uh, just uh, two little holes at the side of the head. That, that, no hair, and the coloration... Uh, I think Don and I have always attributed the differences in, in coloration to uh, the state of uh, de- uh, deterioration of the body and maybe the lighting. We've had everything from uh, beige to, to pinkish to bluish, something like that. And uh, so, you know, just being the recipient of that information from different people, we attribute it to uh, maybe the differences in lighting or differences in the decay, the decay of the body. So uh, that's Have you pretty ever... much it. The, uh, the, all of the descriptions about the size, shape, and things like that were all, all pretty much uh, identical. Have you ever thought about why or heard anyone explain, talk about why they could hold their heads up, which their, their heads are so big and they're, they're so thin and slight? Why they're uh, yeah, why well, they were able to hold their heads up because they're the because gravity is you know you'd think that uh, they wouldn't be able to do that you know you, you know Whitley no no one has ever brought that up but uh, I have I have to you Tom <laughs> As well an that's anthropologist Tom I would ask that question how is it within our air pressure our gravity that based on their skeletal their lower body dimensions that they were able to keep ahead of that proportion upright wow that's a new one on me <laughs> and the question there there too is though and whitley you know this by your own experiences that they still you know have always been described as moving very awkwardly no there's nothing i've never heard a description of an alien in any of these accounts behaving gracefully fluently so they, it's as though they are somewhat out of place here within our atmosphere. So I think we would agree to that. Uh, yeah, the, mus- think- the, muscul- the musculature is not there for like a striding walk. It's, uh, it's, I, I, I would assume it's like 
almost like a stumbling, like you're trying to move a barrel. You know how uh, you you move it from side to side as much as uh, going forward, something like that, because the muscular just uh, is not is not there. Yeah, and, and there's and yet they are very, very, very strong, and uh, I think their bodies. I think there's something that's not entirely biological about their bodies. I'm, I think that these beings are, to an extent, uh, they're mixes of physical and, I mean, of biological and uh, mechanical components. I think you're, you're on to something, Whitley, and we talk about, like, deep space, long-term travel, the idea that as we now are experimenting more and more with uh, uh, bionics, and incorporating as far as uh, robotoid elements, as far as uh, prosthetics, and now as far as certainly internal organ, uh, the idea that there, it would be a combination of biological and robot, which would then enable it to be very strong and still function, and that they, they, the head basically serves as the brain. Um, and, right. and and so the, the the larger cranial as far as dimension, which uh, would be the focal point of the entire being, the entity. I think I, in our investigation, Whitley, I think Don will agree with me. We concentrated more on the overall morphology of the of the creatures, what they looked like, rather than uh, how how did they evolve to that, and uh, would they be able to do this or that? And uh, we never. At least I didn't uh, look too much beyond that uh, as to the overall gross morphology. Yeah, they so. But in any case, one thing is very clear, and that is that these bodies were really, really strange. They were nothing like anything we had seen before. Have you heard anything about their uh, biology? In other words, are they more plant or animal or anything like that? No, as far as even the late Leonard Stringfield in his uh, studies and the interviews he conducted and living in Cincinnati, so he was just down the road from Wright-Patterson in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, he would um, take the accounts of a number of doctors who supposedly were involved with autopsies at uh, the base back in 1947 and shortly thereafter, and would describe that in, internally that they were very similar to us. They had the same type of uh, internal organs, though there may have been more or less of, of certain bones, like ribs, for example, carpal bones within the wrists and in the feet. Uh, the lungs would have been of different sizes, as described, suggesting different pressure, a different atmosphere, that type of thing. Uh, the larger eyes suggesting as far as lesser light source, that type of thing. Um, uh, the, we even had a Lejeune Foster who was in, was supposedly brought in to just uh, examine the spinal cords of the, of the entities recovered at Roswell, suggesting there was a spinal cord, for example. But, but, but Tom is correct in that if for us, it's been mostly just collecting and um, historically recounting the testimony, what the witnesses are describing, not trying to read anything into uh, what uh, they would spell out to us as far as almost as though like a court reporter that uh, we're just taking it down and and then plugging in and going back to previous witnesses because it would generate new questions based on the new information, that type of thing. But, it's, again, it's like, well, why did they tell you that? Why, well, we can't help it. That's what they told us. That's what the witnesses recounted, and we put it down verbatim. So the same Yes, with well, the one, one of Stringfield's uh, uh, medical contacts uh, described the skin as being almost reptilian. Uh, that was just one, one of the... Uh, people who were either involved or observed the autopsy at uh, Wright-Patterson. Yeah, he tiny described, scales. Sca scaly, uh, almost like a... Uh, 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 I don't know, but it, he didn't say scales, but you know how, like, the underbelly of a chameleon is. It's, uh, it's reptilian, it's uh, 
uh, not scaly, but uh, something almost scaly. Well, and actually, the underbelly of, of, of uh, that, that, that you're describing, if you look at it under a microscope, there are tiny scales there. Okay, well, I, I haven't I haven't looked under the microscope. So. <laughs> so you're so you're saying then that you've got a being that seems to be partly physical or partly biological, and maybe with some mechanical components like the interior structures, like the, yeah. and the, then the there bones. Was, well, there's and then another these... one that uh, Stringfield talks about. Another doctor that uh, uh, see this is they gave they gave. Uh, Slightly different uh, versions, and uh, you know you, you, you're you're reading this, and you say, "Oh my goodness!" Well, which which one is correct? We have another doctor that was at uh, Wright Patterson said some of the internal uh, structures reminded him of insects, some insectoid. So you think, "Oh my goodness, what?" Uh, yeah, you know, what? I, that that sounds real to me uh, because I've always thought that the internal structures being human like. It's uh, anything is possible, but the stories of the internal structures being quite different and the whole entity having a more insectoid kind of quality to it, it like uh, like something that's been designed uh, by and and the different forms have been used in the design uh, uh, as needed. In other words, the skin is reptilian because this is what is most durable under the circumstances the the uh the hard structures are metallic because that's so strong and light and then the organs that the functional organs are the most durable and then and then you get down to simple functional organs like insect organs yes and yet yet you have this huge head which would require in our world an enormous amount of blood and insect organs can't pump that much blood in the in, in the insect world that we know. It's just such an enigma, isn't it? It, it, it is, and even when it, it it comes down to, you know, as simple as the wreckage, the material is involved, and the the, the, the paper thin quality, and yet they were nearly indestructible. Yeah, and did you ever find out anything more? About those materials. Well, uh, you, you know, Don and I are we're it's, uh, investigating the totality of the case, and it involves uh, a, a, a lot of uh, inter- interviewing of witnesses. Now, uh, the witnesses have really uh, diminished, uh, you know, greatly since we yeah. started. But the Air Force uh, must be so happy. Yes, yes, they ran out the clock on us. Uh, but we, there's a fellow in Florida who, I'd say about 10 years ago, uh, he said, what have, you know, he asked, you know, what about the wreckage? And I, we said, well, it was taken to right tatters, the right field. And he said, well, what have you done about after it got there? And we said, well, we have a few witnesses who claim they saw it. His name, the fellow's name is Anthony Bregalio. And uh, for the last 10 years, he's devoted his investigation solely to what happened to the material when, after it got to Wright-Patterson or Wright-Field. And uh, he, what he did is amazing because uh, we're talking about uh, you know, something that happened in 1947. And he went by what uh, Arthur Exxon described uh, about the, the 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 metal, Exxon said that to his re, his recall that it was mostly titanium, but there was some other element involved. But the processing of the titanium was different, and so Bergalia took off on that particular uh, bent, and he found a couple of articles that, 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 talking about the processing of titanium and. Uh, Mixing it with uh, other uh, other materials to form what he called shape shifting metal, self healing metal, and memory metal. He plugged those things into the, your browser, and up came a whole bunch of stuff, which ultimately led him back to Wright Patterson in a project that they uh, gave to Battelle Memorial Institute in 1948 to replicate the memory metal. 
This is an amazing piece of research that Tony was able to do, and he 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 found references. Get this, uh, Whitley. He found references in some of these scientific articles, which you know, for me, when I read a totally scientific article, my uh, my head starts to explode and my eyes glaze over. But the Tony was able to find in a footnote of some of these that they referenced a contract with uh, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and that led him to Battelle Memorial Institute. And he got these two progress reports that Battelle wrote back to uh, Wright-Pat one in 1948 and one in 1949, both of which he was initially told didn't exist. They were destroyed. Tony found them in the Department of Defense. And uh, this jives with a uh, person that was interviewed by Dr. Irina Scott years ago. His name was Elroy J. Center, who claimed that he was a uh, chemical analyst at the Tell Memorial Institute. When one day they dumped some strange metal on his desk, they, he said, "They said try to figure out what this stuff is." And he described this memory metal to uh, to a person who told Irene uh, Scott, Irina Scott. So it all comes together. And what you can do is if you go to your uh, computer, put in the word nitinol, N-I-T-I-N-O-L, into your browser and see what comes up. That's our best attempt at replicating the so-called memory metal that was derived from the Roswell crash. And that came from studies from Battelle Memorial Institute. Uh, and uh, they worked on it for years, starting in 1948. And what's interesting, Tony found out that there was no, no investigations, no uh, studies of this sort of thing prior to 1948 uh, anywhere, and uh, it, everything points to Roswell. So uh, very interesting. But it took one person devoting his entire search for ten years on this one aspect of the Roswell case, which Don and I, like I said, we're we're you know we we have the whole case and uh of course whenever we get a story about the bodies we zero in on it and uh, they usually just you know wind up with uh uh the the gross morphology and not not some of the why did why did it develop this way and uh what does that suggest to you and that sort of thing like uh like we interviewed uh uh, you talked about the German paperclip scientists. They were they were heavily involved as well, and we interviewed several of them. And one of them, uh, we talked to the son of this paperclip uh, rocket scientist. His name was Ernst Steinhoff. He was second in command of the, these uh, German scientists. Uh, the the von Braun was the the was the leader. This fellow was second in command. Ernst Steinhoff. And uh, he would never tell his sons. They, although they asked him, "Dad, what, what was that Roswell about? You, you were there." And he was said, uh, his answer to them was, "Those who know don't talk, and those who talk don't know." Yeah, so that, that was, I heard that one too many times myself. <laughs> so, so uh, that's the, that, that ended the, the debate with his son. Until uh, a fellow came into the, the museum, and I let Don pick this up because he talked to Don, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 what was his first name? Uh, Cornelius Blesius. Don talked to him, and uh, that led us to Ernst Steinhoff and uh, the, uh, the German paperclip uh, involvement. So, and he was his personal physician, so he confided to him before he died, and he described that he and a number of uh, the other rocket experts who had worked with Von Braun uh, were brought over to Roswell, and at the time, as far as the uh, the personnel with paper clips, you know, they would only be escorted, you know, to certain projects under military uh, a guard, so to speak. And that, that they would risk having, you know, brought some of these German scientists into the picture, 
to specifically look at the Roswell wreckage. It wasn't uh, the biological remains, it was the material. What can you Germans, what can you tell us about this material? Have you ever seen anything like it before? And, uh, you know, down to a man, it was the same, you know, uh, the puzzlement, the same uh, bewilderment as to heaven help us if this isn't from here, because we've never seen anything like it uh, in our research. And it, it continued to demonstrate that this was way beyond the pale, that there was nothing in the Army manual that they could, you know, resort to in checking, you know, what was transpiring, uh, you know, from um, moment to moment, hour to hour, day to day situation with the entire Roswell affair. And the fact that there is a part two, that there is a story beyond Roswell, and I think it's something that often gets lost in, in the whole storyline. Yeah. There, uh, there are witnesses, as we described at the very beginning, on the receiving end, who then did all the testing, all the analysis. And then it still comes back to all the deathbed testimonies, whether at Roswell, whether at Wright-Patterson, uh, and a down to a man and a woman, and deathbeds being admissible in a court of law. They all describe the bodies. They all mention as far as the non-human bodies recovered at Roswell. And that's what continues to just, you know, re remain unbelievable. We, that's why we still have such a passion for the entire incident, because Roswell is the granddaddy of them all. It's the one case that could blow this wide open overnight. And right, Pat, was just the second phase of what had originally happened in 1947 outside of Roswell, New Mexico. And yet there is also a persistent story that there are other sites, uh, even in Diana walsh Pasoka's new book, American Cosmic, she refers to one of them in New Mexico as something that is known as the donation site, where it is believed that it was an intentional dropping of a craft in order for us to uh, be able to pick up material from it, which apparently, according to her book, we have been doing ever since. So That was a, that was a, a theory that I came up with, with Dr. Mark Rodiger at the Center for UFO Studies probably about 28 years ago, where he suggested at that time, wouldn't it be you know, uh, ironic that in the way that they announced their presence, in the most, as far as non-threatening, the most uh, mortal way possible to demonstrate their own mortality, their own fallibility, and that they crashed one, just to demonstrate that they were not a threat, that they could, you know, at least deal with it, it cushioned the blow, so to speak, and that, and it didn't, as we know. No, and, mean, and we've been was, fighting them ever since. I mean, you ever know, uh, since. Frank Fischino's book, Shoot Him Down. Yes, yes. I mean, that's really almost definitive. And in fact, we know that those orders were extant at that time. Yeah, they were even in, mentioned in the newspapers of the time. The Seattle Post Intelligence are being one of them in 52. Uh, we have come to the end of this segment, folks. Free Dreamlanders, have a great week, and I wish and hope that you would subscribe to unknowncountry.com because that is what keeps us going. We are not into advertising. We do not uh, do any uh, uh, of that type of marketing. Uh, this is a very privacy-respecting organization and website. So anyway, thank you very much for being with, with us. Subscribers, we're going to go a lot deeper. We're going to be talking about what happened to the memory metal, and is it any of it been bled out into the public, and will it ever be? Do we really understand it yet? We're also going to be talking about some really remarkable incidents, such as the time that Black Mac Magruder came face-to-face -face with one of the visitors and how that felt to him and what then happened. Really remarkable stuff. These guys know a lot. UFO secrets inside Wright Patterson. Eyewitness accounts from the real Area 51. You've been listening to Dreamland. Be sure to tune in again next week. Dreamland is brought to you by UnknownCountry.com and its family of subscribers. 
Unknown Country was founded by Ann Streber. Our news editor is Matthew Frizzell. Our coordinator is Amy Safrankova. Whitley Streber is your Dreamland host. And I'm your announcer, Ted Alexander. Thank you for listening.